All right, Helena, how are we doing? The Bible says that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was taken outside the ancient city of Jerusalem. He was taken to a spot called Golgotha, that if you translate it into our language, basically just means the skull or the place of the skull. And there, the most selfless, the most romantic, the most heroic, the most loving thing that has ever been done in human history took place. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. And that is what Skull Church is all about. It's all about Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why we're making such a big deal, because it's the biggest deal. What Jesus has done for us and what he wants to do still. And it's a real joy uh, to be here with you in Helena. My name's Levi, and uh, I'm just, I, I've been having so much fun being here in the capital city. It's a, it's a, I, I've found that it is a great place, Helena, Montana. And you know that, you live here. I've had a lot of fun exploring the, the city the last couple days. And uh, we're, just so you know, of course, packed house here uh, at, the, uh, at the Lewis and Clark County Fairgrounds. Uh, but we are also being joined on the live stream from people on iPod touches, iPhones, on laptops, all over the country and even the world. Uh, they just told me there's people who have written, tweeted in with the hashtag school church, which by the way, if you haven't, do that. Send out a tweet or whatever, or a text message to someone lo-fi in your life who may not see the tweet but isn't here and could join us at schoolchurch.com. There's people in Miami, Iceland, El Salvador, Mexico City. So from right here in the capital of Montana, can we say hello to everyone joining us on the webcast, schoolchurch.com? Come on, go crazy. There you go. There's a rowdy hello from those who are living in the last best place. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about the resurrection of the dead tonight. And when I say that, I mean it just like it sounds. I'm talking about graves exploding, tombstones toppling, caskets opening, corpses moving. I'm going to talk to you about dead people rising. Now, I know that does sound more movie than sermon. Zombies are really big right now. So popular. I read that the number one most watched TV show in America on cable TV right now is The Walking Dead. Yeah, that's right. Close, followed close behind by Duck Dynasty, which has to get honorable mention. We have to at least mention that just because those beards are wicked awesome. But, uh, and Psy is wicked crazy. So now we're all clear on, on that. But, uh, but it's not just... Hollywood that, that likes to talk about zombies. The Bible has a lot to say about, about the resurrection from the dead as well. And it is that that we want to give our attention, not just the fact of the resurrection of the dead that the Bible speaks about, but the hope that comes from it. That's what we get, hope, from this subject, the, that the dead will rise. And I'll tell you this, hope is what we need more than anything else. You see, so many people are hopeless. I read recently that every 13.7 minutes in America, someone takes their life, someone commits suicide. Over 37,000 Americans every single year choose to take their life. So many are hopeless. And tragically, even more so, it's, it's a disproportionate amount of young people that are taking their lives. Uh, it's the third leading cause of death for young people in this country, meaning that those who should have the most hope, those with their whole life, their whole future ahead of them are, are oftentimes the one who have the, the least hope. And it's not just those who take their lives. So many secretly struggle silently on the inside. So many take their, take their frustration out on, on their own body by cutting themselves, by starving themselves to look like something. So many people are, are hopeless. We live in a day of, of anxiety a day of fear. We live in a day of depression and of doubt and of, of, of uncertainty about love, of uncertainty about what the future holds, uncertainty about the economy, uncertainty about whether those in, in control and in government are, are, have our best interests in mind. We live in a time of pain and, and of sorrow, of suffering, and, and we need hope. We need hope to live with. We need hope to die with. And through Jesus Christ, that is exactly what we're given. I've titled this message, An Anchor for the Soul. An Anchor for the Soul, because that's exactly what the Bible says it's like 
when you have hope. The Bible says, Hebrews 6.19, hope is like an anchor for your soul that's both sure and steadfast. You see, an anchor can hold a ship in the worst conditions. I had the chance to walk the last chance Gulch Street to the top uh, where, uh, where there's that anchor park. And I was, I, was, I was excited to see that at the top of the anchor park, they had actually brought in a, an enormous anchor and propeller from, from the USS Helena, this massive, massive ship. And, uh, and the, the anchor, if you, if you um, of course, you live here, you've seen it, you're like, yeah, yeah, thank you. Please tell us more about this place we live in every day. I, okay, I'm talking to those in Iceland now. Um, <laughs> There's this park in Helena with this, this giant propeller and this, this enormous anchor. I mean, it's way taller than I am. And, and there's actually the chain that, that holds this anchor or did at one point. And each link of the chain is like this big. The, the anchor itself is probably 14 feet tall. I imagine the thing weighs, weighs 20 tons. And it, it would have to be that big to hold a ship that's 18 stories tall fast when you drop that thing overside. But the great thing about an anchor is that it, it causes a ship to, to, to be rooted, to be planted. No matter what waves come, no matter, no matter how difficult and how stormy things get, it, it holds a ship fast. And hope is like that. When you have hope inside your soul, it's like an anchor that can keep you in the worst that can come against you, in all that life can throw at you. It can allow you to face the unimaginable, endure the unthinkable, and go through things that are so hard you wouldn't believe it would even be possible to survive, much less survive. You see, hope changes everything. And hope has a name, and it's Jesus Christ. And hope is here. It's possible. It's available. It's offered freely. Now, to put this to the test, that hope can keep you, hope can save you, hope can hold you, we need to look no further than the Old Testament book of Job. If you have a Bible, we're going to look at a few verses from Job chapter 19 in just a moment. For there is perhaps no one who has suffered more than him. But before we jump into this passage we're going to look at, let me give you a little bit of a previously on the life of Job. You see, Job was a very wealthy man. I read that at one point in history, there were more millionaires living in Helena per capita than any other city in the entire world. There were so many millionaires suddenly rich because, of course, of the gold bonanza in the late 1800s. Well, Job was a very rich man. He was the, the richest person we know about living on the earth in his day. And yet, in just one day, his entire life savings and his entire business was taken out from under him. He went from being the richest person to having nothing in just a moment of time. You see, all of his money was tied up in the stock market, the livestock market, cattle, sheep, donkeys. Actually, the Bible says he had 500 female donkeys that they kept for milking. Have you ever had donkey milk? Hashtag gross. Hashtag no, right? No, thank you. Donkey milk, really? Apparently, it was, it, Job, Job was a big fan. He had it with his granola every single morning. But he had diversified his holdings so that this kind of thing wouldn't happen. He had kept his camel over here in this region, his camels over here, his female donkeys for milking over in this region. He had, he had his, his sheep over here and this over here. His business was all split up, split up so that if there was a disaster over here, it wouldn't affect what was over here. But it was just a series of unrelated events that happened here, 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 a fire, an earthquake. This happened, this happened, this happened. And all of a sudden, he was notified. He got the text, Job, you're bankrupt. You have nothing. Everything's just been taken, didn't devastate. You have nothing. He had his own personal Great Depression, which would be enough for some people to cause you to plunge into an irrecoverable tailspin. Did you know that during the 1920s in the Great Depression and in the 2008 recession, there were a number of high-profile millionaires and billionaires who found out via an email that they had just been basically decimated in their net worth, and they just went immediately out and took their lives, had nothing more to live for if they couldn't have all of their money. But that wasn't the worst of it. You see, before Job even had time to process, I mean, how do you do with something like that? Hey, by the way, you have no money. Okay, before he even had time to let that sink in, 
another messenger arrived with even worse news. And by that, I mean the worst news. Apparently, Job had 10 kids, seven sons and three daughters, and they all had been at a banquet at one of his son's house, and they were all killed in an accident that had caused the building they were in to collapse. And so this servant, I don't know how to tell you this, Job, all of your children have died. Now that, of course, if you're a parent, is, is every mom and dad's worst nightmare to, to have to face the, the death of your child, which, as you saw in the movie a little bit ago, is what our life has been like in this past year. As our five-year-old daughter, Linya, just a kindergartner, uh, suddenly and unexpectedly was called to heaven. As a mom or dad, you would, you would gladly trade your life in a moment if you could. Really, in a lot of ways, having to, f- to go through the death of, of your child, it's, it's a fate worse than death. As I think about Job, his grief to, to have to face the, the loss of all of his children simultaneously dying on the, on the same day, the, the pain is more than I can even fathom. And then another thing happened. His own health deteriorated. Suddenly, out of nowhere, he all of a sudden had this crazy, ravaging his flesh disease. Uh, Here's what the Bible says. He had boils show up on his skin, skin lesions. His hair started falling out. He had a mouth infection, stomach problems. That's a nice way of saying diarrhea without saying diarrhea in church, but we're in a, what is this? But, so I think I can say diarrhea. Can I say diarrhea? Is that okay? I just did. What are you going to do about it? You don't have a microphone? (laughs) Job's health got so bad that he eventually moved to the edge of town to the, to the garbage dump. Remember, he had no home anymore. He moved into the garbage dump. He sat down on a, on a pile of ashes, and he picked up a piece of, of pottery, and he just began to, to scrape his, his skin with it just to itch and have some relief from, from this pain. All of his friends assumed this was karma. And they basically said, you must have done, no one has this bad of luck. You must have done something wrong that would cause God to punish you in this way. His wife showed up and basically said to him, Job, you ought to curse God and then die. Thanks, honey. (laughs) Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Bible, you know the backstory on this that Job doesn't know. And that's that his friends were wrong. This wasn't karma. God wasn't mad at him. God wasn't out to get him. This actually happened, ironically enough, because God thought he was awesome. For real. One day, God was bragging on Job to the devil, right? God was like, have you seen Job? That that cat is rad. And the devil's like, yeah, but he has it easy. You've given him all kinds of great privilege and stuff. If you took it away, if you let me at him, if you give me a week with him, I'll have him getting a 666 tattoo on his forehead by, the, by, the, by, by Sunday. God said, have at it. He gave Satan. This, this happened because God was pleased with Job, not because he was mad at him. This whole thing was a test. But here's what you have to understand. Job didn't get to read the book of Job. He didn't know. Like, he wasn't like, let me turn to the book of me and check things out. He didn't know what was happening in heaven. He didn't know God was bragging about him. He didn't know the devil was the one doing this and not God. All he knew is that he had tried his hardest to honor God. He had tried his hardest to do what God wanted. And then he's just walking along, and the bottom drops out. And yet, in the midst of what is not an exaggeration at all to say that he lost everything on the earth, in all of this, the Bible says Job never once blamed God. In fact, what he did, though he was sorrowful, though he was, he was in great agony processing all of this, the Bible says that, that he dropped to his knees and he said, God, you've given and you've taken away. I bless your name. And he lifted up his hands that were shaking and he lifted his eyes to heaven even as tears burned and streaked down his face. And he worshiped God there in that ash heap. And his actions there on that day have functioned as a template for people who have faced grief the world over. My wife and I, just now 10 and a half months ago in an emergency room, we found ourselves saying the same things to God 
as we began to live our own personal nightmare. Now, I know without having gone through it, every time I ever read the book of Job, I, I thought to myself, how could anybody have such a magnificent courage in the face of hardship? How could Job suffer so well? And the answer is that Job had hope. It's hope and anchor for your soul. And I want to look with you now, if you're with me in Job 19, if you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the verses on the screen for you, at three verses where his hope is on display. Verse 25, Job says, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another, how my heart yearns within me. These three verses, they effectively reveal the anchor that was holding Job's soul, that enabled him to weather these storms he was facing without losing heart. And I believe that because you and I are guaranteed to suffer, we're guaranteed that trials happen, that living in this world, we do have trouble, that if we extract the truth from this passage and put it into play in our hearts, in our lives, that we will be able to suffer with courage as Job, no matter what comes our way. All right? A few things, if you have a note on your phone, you can take a little notes with. I want to give you just a few things, impart a few things from this passage that Job believed. The first is this. Job believed, Job knew that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. He said that. He said it in verse 25. He said, for I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, here's what's crazy about this. At the point when Job lived on the earth, Jesus hadn't come yet, all right? So he is speaking about an event that is past to us. We live looking, counting time, 2013, year since Jesus Christ uh, came, right? Before Christ, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So we actually measure time by an event that, that is indisputable. It's in the dictionary. Jesus Christ, a historical figure, figure, okay? So we look back at Jesus coming. Job looked forward. So in his day, Jesus hadn't come yet, and yet he believed what God promised, and that is that Jesus would come. And he believed that he would rise from the dead. Though he wasn't even born yet, Job believed that he would die and then rise. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ came into the world and eventually was barbarically butchered on the cross there at the place of the skull. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, but the tomb couldn't hold him. Because on the third day, he rose from the dead, defeating the grave, defeating death. The Bible says he took the keys from death and Hades. He was dead, but he lives. He's the resurrection and the life. Jesus is alive. And this is a fact that is verified by the many witnesses that saw him after he died, saw him alive. They spoke with him. They ate with him. They walked with him. They touched him. Up to 500 people at one time saw Jesus. And this explains the dramatic difference in Jesus' disciples from before he died to after he rose. Remember, when he was arrested, they all ran away. They were terrified. Peter was so scared that he was going to get arrested too that he denied Jesus Christ three times to a servant girl in front of a fire. I have no idea who Jesus is. No, I'm, are you his follower? No, I'm not his follower. Okay? They're all running. They're hiding behind locked doors. They're terrified. It's like a Scooby-Doo episode. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but then, all of a sudden, after the resurrection, the disciples are completely different people. They're fearless. They don't care what it costs them. Most of them, except for one, go on to die for Jesus Christ. They're, they're courageous. The same Peter who denied him stands up and preaches on, on the day of Pentecost, and thousands come to know Jesus Christ. Now, they had nothing to gain, no incentive to make up a lie that they had seen Jesus. They, all they gained was dying for him, for standing up for him. But they couldn't deny what they had seen with their own eyes. 
It's absolutely vital you understand this. Jesus rose from the dead. They saw him and couldn't help but bear witness to that fact. And if you miss this, that Jesus is alive, that he rose from the dead, you miss everything when it comes to Christianity because it's the cornerstone. It's the linchpin. Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. It's like a jet ski or a snowmobile with the, the kill switch pulled, you know, that bracelet, that coiled thing. That you, you yank that thing, the engine just, just dies. You pull the resurrection away from Christianity, and it just it comes grinding to a, a halt. Now, a lot of people would have you think that Jesus is just a nice guy, did some miracles, gave some epic little sermons, dropped some golden rule-like science and, and some Yoda fortune cookie sayings and, and did some good things that we should all follow his lead on. They basically reduced Jesus to Mr. Rogers wearing a beard. Now, I know I date myself with any Mr. Rogers fans who grew up Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers. Welcome to the neighborhood. And uh, won't you be my neighbor and stuff. And I'm flashing back to my childhood here. But this, this, those who would reduce him to basically just being a good example would say he, he's, he's a great example to follow, but there's no way he rose from the dead. But here's the, here's the truth. If he didn't rise from the dead, then there's no way he could be a nice person. Because a nice person doesn't walk around saying things like, I will rise from the dead. That's the kind of person, if, man, if you can't back that up, we're going to lock you up, you know? <laughs> Nice people don't walk into funerals and say, don't worry, I am the resurrection. It, it, that's, that's not nice. If you can't back that up, if you don't have the goods, that makes you a very, very sick person, a deranged person, which is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. If that's the case, all who ever lived and died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, meaning he was just a good example, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Listen to me. If it's not true, then none of it's true. But because it is true, because he did rise, then our preaching is not useless. Our faith is not in vain. Our sins, they can be forgiven. Our hope is not misplaced. Our anchor holds. It's sure and steadfast. Christ has entered the veil. And he's able to keep what we have entrusted to him until that day. And that's why Job, in faith, said, I know that my Redeemer lives because Jesus is alive. Second thing you need to know that Job knew, and that is this, that he is coming again. Jesus is not only alive, having risen from the dead, he is coming again. Now, Job started by describing an event, the coming of Christ and his death and resurrection, that is past to us, but was future to him. He now references an event that is future to him and to us. He leapfrogs us all together, and he refers to an event that as of today still hasn't happened yet. Verse 25, not only does my Redeemer live, look what he says. He says, and he shall stand at last on the earth. What's he talking about? Because today Jesus isn't standing on the earth. He ascended into heaven after he rose from the dead with the promise that he would come again. So what Job is talking about is none other than the second coming of Jesus Christ, what Tennyson referred to as that one far-off divine event towards which all creation moves. This is the moment where the Son of God will split the sky and return to the earth that he made in power and great glory, and he will judge the living and the dead according to the gospel. And when he comes, it's going to be quite a day. It's going to be the day of days. The Bible calls it the day of the Lord. Now you hear that and you think, what's that day going to be like? Here, here's what it's going to be like. Ready? It's going to be the exact opposite of Christmas. Okay? Because we know he came once and he's promised to come again. And we look at what it was like when he came the first time. And basically, when he came the first time, he came in obscurity. He was a baby, literally born in a barn in Bethlehem. He was raised in a city that people made fun of, Nazareth. People made jokes about him 
that he couldn't read. Oh, from Nazareth. Oh, probably, probably don't know how to read, do you? They called his mom a whore, doubting this notion of a virgin birth. Yeah, our birth was virgin too. It wasn't anything that happened after prom. It was a virgin birth. Sure, Jesus, at least we know who our dad is, is the kind of stuff he heard. He eventually was hated, betrayed by those that he loved. He was spit on. His beard was torn off of his face. And he was murdered in the most painful way anyone has ever died, the death of crucifixion, hanging from a cross with nails in his hands, a crown of thorns upon his head. In short, when he came the first time, he came as the Lamb of God, slain for the sins of the world. But Jesus said when he returns, it will be like the lightning that flashes from the east to the west. When he comes back, he won't come back as a lamb. He will come back as the ruling, reigning, conquering lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he will establish his kingdom on earth, and his will will be done. And that is what's so great about Jesus standing on the earth, his will being done. Here's what you need to know. When he stands on the earth, there will be things that he won't stand for that are currently happening right here. His will will be done, and he won't stand for cancer anymore. He won't stand for crime anymore. He won't stand for crying anymore. He won't stand for, for stealing anymore. The Bible says that these former things will pass away. Eden will be regained. Paradise will be once again on the earth. What Jesus wants to happen will happen. And that means we won't have to cry anymore. We won't have to die anymore. We won't have to say goodbye anymore. We're talking about heaven on earth. His will done. And when I say that word heaven, I want to make sure that you understand biblically that heaven has nothing to do with the cultural connotation, the baggage we drag into. Because I know you're probably doing it right now. I said, we're going heaven, heaven. And immediately you were thinking this opaque, ethereal, floating around existence, wearing a white dress with a halo and chubby baby naked angels flitting around. <laughs> Listen to me. I have read this entire Bible, and I have never once seen anything about a chubby baby naked angel. So I don't know where they came from, but that is not heaven. That is not paradise. And that's what Jesus called heaven. When would you use the word paradise? We'd describe places like Maui and like Montana, you know, places like that. And and, and Jesus used the word paradise to describe heaven, a lush tropical garden, the Greek word actually brings with it. And, and you have to understand, when we think about heaven, we're talking about this earth, which has beauty in it, which has a there's adventure to be had, there's, there's laughter and competition, there's eating and there's fun, there's friendship, there's games. And he is going to preserve all the good things about the earth, but it's going to be with the curse removed with no more sin, with no more evil, with no more death, with no more with, of all these things that, that defile. It's going to be paradise. And that's why it gave Je Job great hope to think of Jesus standing at last on the earth. It was an anchor to his soul to know that Jesus is coming again. Here's the third thing that Job tells us in his passage. It's the third point. He said, we must all face the shadow of death, the valley of shadow of death. We must all face the valley of shadow of death. Job's hope wasn't based on him being in denial, OK? He knew the facts. And this is, in fact, what makes his hope so real, that he wasn't trying to put a nice face on an ugly thing. He recognized. He was, he was aware of the reality of death. That's why in verse 26, he says, look at this phrase, after my skin is destroyed. All of this truth about Jesus coming and standing on the earth and heaven, it was all accepting the truth that currently there's a problem, and it's called death. After my skin is destroyed. What is that phrase referring to? Well, Job is speaking very bluntly about what we pay funeral homes to delay or what we pay for cremation to accelerate, and that is the decomposition of the human body in dishonor sewn back into the earth after 
after someone dies. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And Job knew all too well the bitter truth about the fact that after someone dies, their, their body, it is, it is no longer inhabited. It's no longer being used. And it will eventually return to, to the ground. He had had to bury 10 of his children, remember? Not to mention all the funerals he went to for friends and, and other loved ones before his, his children all, all died. He knew the harsh reality of the grave, and he wasn't glossing over it. And it makes his hope even more meaningful that he accepts this as being true right now. And I need you to accept with me the reality of our mortality. You and I are going to die. Every single one of us. Every single person you've ever met is going to die. The Bible says it is appointed for man once to die, and then the judgment, Hebrews 9.27. There's a grave somewhere. There's a cemetery somewhere that your family is going to select. That's a difficult job to pick where you're going to, but you are going to be placed into a casket. Your, your body's going to be buried. They're all going to gather and say some words and walk away, but, but your body's going to remain there or be scattered into the wind. That day is approaching. You have less life to live than you did when you woke up this morning. Now, this is true no matter who you are. No matter how popular, no matter how rich you are, the Bible says that the rich people and the poor people in this world have this in common. God made us all. And for us all, there's going to be a manufacturer's recall. Even for celebrities. I read an interview with Johnny Depp recently. He's one of the most successful actors of our day. Billion dollars in grossing films. He gets millions and millions just for doing stuff like putting a bird on his head. And, and, uh, and this is the kind of thing that that we all, many of us, look at is, if I only had this, I'd be happy. Not, I'm not talking about the bird on your head. I'm talking about, I'm talking about being rich and, and being famous, being celebrated. Many people think, man, if I could be rich and famous, I'd be happy. And yet, listen to what he said in the interview. He said, quote, I still don't know what I want to be. There's a great part of me that thinks it wouldn't be so bad to just split for a few years. Thoughts of retirement pop up every day. The interviewer was surprised. Johnny Depp wants to retire. He said, then what are you going to do? Here's what he said. I guess I would live life, really live life. I'd go somewhere where you don't have to be on the run or sneak in through the kitchen or the underground labyrinth of the hotel. At a certain point, when you get old enough or you get a few brain cells back, I guess, you realize that on some level, you've been living the life of a fugitive. He was asked about his thoughts on what happens after life? He said, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in ghosts. He said, well, what do you think? He said, I think we're just here, and that's kind of it. And then it's just dirt and worms. Now, regardless of what you believe about the afterlife, regardless of what your thoughts are on the meaning of life, Johnny Depp is right about one thing for sure, and that is that dirt and worms are in our future. Job put it this way. He didn't dole the blow. He said, our flesh will be destroyed. There's no way around that. The only certain thing about life is that it's going to end. We must all face the valley of the shadow of death, and we will do it alone. You don't stand before God in groups. You don't stand before God with your friends or your parents. That's why what other people think about your faith, what other people think about what you do with your soul is of no concern. You're going to stand before God alone. Here's the fourth thing. OK, that was necessary. We needed to acknowledge that. But listen to the fourth thing. Yes, you will die. But here's the fourth thing Job knew. The grave doesn't get the last word. The grave doesn't get the last word. Yes, it gets to take its best shot. Yes, the grave gets to take your body after you die. But here's what Job said next, verse 26. After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh, I shall see God. Job here is affirming what all of Scripture attests and claims to be true. And that is that death is not the end of the road. Death is a bend in the road. This is true because you are not your body. You have a soul. Or as C.S. Lewis put it, you are a soul. You have a body. And though you die in your your body, which is like a tent, the Bible says, is dissolved. Who you are, your soul, leaves the tent and moves on. It doesn't end your existence to die. 
When your body is taken down, your, your tent, your old man is discarded, your soul goes to either heaven or hell, the Bible says. But your body, here's the cool thing, which is buried and slowly returns to dust, will not stay there forever. You see, not only are the souls of those who have come to faith in Jesus Christ safe and sound in heaven today, in paradise today, but what death has taken from us will be returned. This is called the resurrection. Just as Jesus rose from the dead in the same body he lived in. You know that, right? When people saw Jesus, it wasn't like another version of him. It wasn't an apparition. It wasn't just his soul. That's why he told the disciples, it's me. It's not a ghost. And then he was like, touch me. Put your finger in my wounds. Give me food. I'll eat it. I am not a ghost. Remember Scooby-Doo episode? They were like, go, 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 ghost. He's like, no. Ghost, Jesus, <laughs> high five, right? Secret handshake, right? Let's, let, give me some fish. Give me some honeycomb. All proof. He, he rose from the dead. His soul, which was in paradise with the Father after he died, came back in the same body, and it was resurrected. That same body came out of the tomb, and he lives today in that same resurrected, transformed, glorious body right now. And he promised, Philippians 3.21, for every single believer, listen to this, he will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Okay? So the promise is that just as his body, which lay there cold and still inside the tomb, the borrowed tomb, and his heart wasn't beating, his blood wasn't pumping, and it was there for three days, cold and and, and, and dead. But then it took on life again. So the Bible says that no matter how long is, is separated from our death to when he comes back, that our bodies will one day be transformed into the same glorious body. So that tells us that when, jo when Jesus rose from the dead, he wasn't just proving that he was stronger than death. He was also displaying the, the model, the new model that we were going to get to live in one day and when, when, we, when we get to rise as well. Now you think, well, hold on a second. What about those who died a 1,000 years ago? What about if I get cremated? You said ashes to ashes, dust to dust. How is he ever going to make my new body if I'm dust is, is, is the question. And the answer is, uh, he's done it once before. Genesis somebody. God formed man of the dust of the earth. So we return to dust. Not a problem. He's God. Once you get that, everything becomes far easier to swallow. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you can get past Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, then you're good for the rest of it. Because if he's God, then he can do whatever he wants. He's the most high God. There's none like him. He says the word. And there is light. He created it with the word of his power. He will recreate. He will, he will cause your, your bones to live once again. And I think about this all the time. My wife and I, we think about this all the time. Because just as Jesus' disciples got to hold the same body that hung on the cross and love him with again, and we will see that body. We will get to, to be with him. So we are so comforted by the fact that we won't just get to see Linya again in heaven as, as souls, but that I'll get to hold that same wonderful, sweet, spunky five-year-old. That, that, that same body is going to, like a seed that goes into the ground, is going to come out a glorious body like Christ. And we're going to get to hold that same body again, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It changes everything because the grave doesn't get the last word on our death either. Only our bodies will come out better like Christ's body. They will no longer be susceptible to weakness or to decay or, or to sickness or, or to allergies or to asthma. And this gave Job great hope, facing not just his death. Remember, he had to go through the death of all of his children. Though they died, he knew he would see them again. Now, I got to just tell you something that's beautiful in the book of Job. If you've ever read it, you understand that at the end of the story, God reveals what has been going on, and Job is restored. He's given everything that he had taken away from him back double, okay? Two times as much as he had in the beginning is what he has in the end, except his children, okay? So he gets twice as many goats, twice as many female donkeys for milking. He gets twice as many camels, twice as many sheep. He has twice as much money, twice as many employees, twice as many servants, twice as big of a, of a house. But the Bible says he was given 10 kids for the 10 that were taken from him. 
And it's interesting. You look at why would he get twice of everything but not the children? And I love an old famous preacher explained it this way. He still had the 10 that were in heaven. God regarded his children who had died as still being Job's. They were dead to Job's eye, but they were visible to Job's faith. So in the end, technically, he did get twice as many kids. He had 10 on earth and 10 in heaven. And that's how we view it, because we have four daughters. We have three on earth, and we have one in heaven. But I still have four daughters. This anchors my soul. It anchors Job's soul. And the promise that comes from Jesus can be an anchor for your soul as well. It doesn't take away the pain, full disclosure, but it takes away the despair. A boat that is anchored still gets battered, but it won't get moved. And I can say this from experience because I'll just be honest with you. The last 310 days of our lives have been the hardest of our lives. We miss Linya every moment. We, li we miss her every day. We miss her fiercely. It hurts so much to be separated. It's, it's a panicking feeling as a daddy, as a mom, to be separated from your child. But what I can also tell you is that in the midst of all of this, God has been present. God has been near. God has been real. The bottom dropped out, but God was there. We went through the valley of the shadow of death with peace and with strength and with courage that only can be explained by the Holy Spirit of God being present with us. And everything we believed in the sunshine has proved true in the shade. And I think the fact that our pain doesn't go away makes our triumph and makes our faith even more powerful, even more meaningful. Because our faith doesn't just work when it's fun. Our faith works in the fire, too. And when you have hope, it truly makes you invincible. You can be bent but not be broken. You can be hard pressed but not be crushed. You can be perplexed but not in despair. You can be persecuted but not forsaken. You can be torn down but not be destroyed. And Jesus Christ is here right now and he's offering that hope to you, an anchor for your soul. Now there's one, there's one final thing that Job says, one final declaration we need to, to look at. The grave does not get the last word. OK, here's the fifth. The ache is meant to lead you home. The ache is meant to lead you home. Concerning all of this that Job has said, he now gives a, a summary statement. And he says this in verse 27. Oh, say that out loud with me. Oh, a little louder now. Oh, all y'all in the cheap seats. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. The actual Hebrew describes his heart pounding out of his chest, OK? Oh, how my heart just pounds out of my chest when I think about these things. Let me, let me, let me help you out what he's, what he's saying. He's saying, when I think about heaven, when I think about Jesus coming, when I think about getting a new body, I mean, he's lying there at this point with, with boils, his hair falling out, our pet's heads are falling off. And he says, oh, how my heart yearns within me. He says, when I think about getting to be with my kids again, how my heart yearns within me. He's describing a, a groaning inside of him, a, a longing, a yearning. He's describing a, a desire to be there, to be in his true homeland. You know, we've all been made for a place and for a person, and that place is heaven. And that person is Jesus. And until we're brought there, the Bible says we all have this same longing in our hearts, this same groaning that Job's describing. When he would think about it, it would just cause his heart to just be beating faster, thinking about being in heaven, thinking about being with Jesus. And, and we all have this same longing inside of us. You might not have ever known to put those words on it, homesickness for heaven, which is what it is. That's what that longing and that growing is homesickness for a place you've never been. But you felt it. Let me, let me explain. When you read in the news of some horrible shooting, isn't there just a groaning inside your heart? Ugh. The week before my baby was taken to heaven, there was that horrible shooting in Connecticut, Newtown. And 
when you read of such a thing, someone opening fire in an elementary school, doesn't your heart groan within you? Don't you just sense uh, an outrage that someone needs to stop this? This shouldn't be allowed to happen. When you, when you hurt yourself, I broke my femur on a snowmobile once, and I just felt like this isn't how life is supposed to be. There's like a groaning, a longing. When someone dies, when you stand, sink to your knees in the cemetery and you look at a grave, someone you don't get to live with anymore that you love, there's a groaning inside your heart. And that is it. That's God's hidden signature inside your soul. The awareness that there, there should be more. There is more to be found. And it's expressed a thousand times a day through people asking, what is the point of this life? What's the meaning of it all? Why should I get out of bed again tomorrow morning? Is it just to get money? Is it just to have a hot girlfriend? Is, is that really it? Is that all there is? Is there not more to be found than I have? I have the great job, or I, I have some money. I did this. I've been on a couple trips. Is there not more? That's the ache that you can't shake. That's the, the secret struggle of your soul to find what you were meant to experience. It's meant to lead you home. A while back, my family and I, we were driving down the road. We had been hanging out with some friends, and we were going back to our hotel. We were both on a trip in the same place. And from the back of our car, we started to hear the strangest sound. Ping, 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 ping. Ping, 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 ping. I look at my wife. I'm like, are we in a submarine? This is weird. What's going on? We pulled the car over <laughs> to investigate and make sure it wasn't a bomb. <laughs> and it was coming from a stroller in the, tr in the back of this SUV. So I pulled the stroller out, and it just the whole time, ping, 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 ping. Pulled the stroller out, and behind the seat, there was an iPhone. <laughs> and the iPhone was sending out an SOS call, apparently. And, and on the screen, it said, if you found my phone, call this number, you know, whatever. And it turns out the friends we had been hanging out with, they had at some point, the, the wife had, been, had, had given her phone to my one-year-old daughter, Clover. Huge mistake. Total kleptomaniac, you know? And she was, she was quick on her feet. She grabbed that thing and hit it. I, I, I can only assume she planned to sell it on eBay at her first opportunity. But they had forgotten about it and went their separate way. And, and so we had done so as well, unknowingly stealing her iPhone. And she had activated on her husband's phone the Find My iPhone feature. And she had said, you know, make the noise. And so that noise, that, that, that sound, that buzzing, it was all an attempt to recover her lost possession. And because of that, we found it. We were able to call and say, hey, yeah, we have your phone. They're like, yeah, we know. We're tracking you. We have the geolocation. We are, we're just a couple blocks. We, we know exactly where you are. And I'm like, <laughs> big brother? <laughs> and so we were able to converge, and the prodigal iPhone was able to go home. But they were able to deploy that sound from within the phone, all in an attempt to get it back. And, and let me tell you, it's the coolest thing ever. The reason that you have this groaning, this, this longing, this ache you can't shake inside of you, this homesickness for a place you've never been, this, this suspicion that there's got to be more, is from God. He's put it inside your heart. The Bible says God put eternity into your soul so that you could never be satisfied with things here on this earth, with, with any possession you could ever find, so that you would grope and long for, and then you would find Him. And until you find Him, your heart will remain restless until you find your rest in Him. No matter what you have, let me just save you some time. No matter what you get on this earth, you will never find that ping, 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 silenced, because it's meant to get you home. I read an interview with Macklemore recently. He's, of course, that Seattle rapper who's responsible for that catchy song, Thrift Shop. I'm going to pop some tags. $20 in my 
I wear your granddad's clothes. I look, well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, he kind of burst onto the scene out of nowhere, it seems. And all of a sudden, he had the number one hit of the year. The article said, as his shows got bigger, his partying got harder, more extreme. He says, quote, I started to get more messed up than ever. All of a sudden, you're young. You have this newfound attention. I was hooking up with these random females. The drugs were getting harder and stronger. I always said I would never do coke, but I broke that. Started doing a little bit of Oxycontin, too, which scared me. Soon his friends began to worry because he wasn't replying to their texts or calls. And eventually, they just gave up because they figured he thought he was too cool for them. But no, mostly he was alone, all by himself, smoking in his bedroom. Turns out that not all that glitters is actually gold. They thought he was so happy, too cool for them with all this stuff, but he was really just alone. He went on to describe he's still looking for happiness. That's why Jesus said in John 4, if you drink of the water of this world, getting high, getting paid, getting laid, faster car, nicer house, bigger boat, better job. He said, you'll just get thirsty again. OK, I got it. Now what? More. OK, I got it. Now what? More. Thirsty again. Thirsty again. Someone has more. Someone has this. Someone has that. It's the groaning inside of you. It's meant to lead you home. He said, it will not quench your thirst. But he said that I, the Son of Man, have living water that I will give you. You can come to Jesus. He'll quench the thirst that you have. He'll fill the hole inside your soul. What's more? Because he died and rose in your place, he can bring you to heaven when you die. So I have a question I want to ask you. Would you like to be forgiven? And that's the only way, by the way. It's not good people that go to heaven. It's forgiven people. And all of us have sinned. And all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. You can't do enough good things to get to heaven. You must receive the life of the one who gave his life for you, Jesus. So would you like to receive Jesus? Would you like to be forgiven? Would you like to be able to lie in bed tonight and go to sleep in peace, knowing that if you were to die, that you would go to heaven? Would you like to have hope as an anchor for your soul? And maybe you're saying, with all my heart, yes, I feel that groaning. I feel that longing. And by the way, if you feel that, it's because God's knocking on the door of your heart. And he promised, if you open the door, I will come in. You would say, what do I need to do if I want to receive Christ? I want to tell you, and if you've heard nothing else I've said, tune in. Listen to this. If you would be saved, you must be willing to admit that you're a sinner. You have to be willing to say to God, God, I'm wrong. You're right. I've done wrong things. I'm going to stop explaining and excusing and rationalizing and justifying, and I'm better than her, and I'm worse, well, maybe a little worse than him, but, but I try my heart. You have to just say, God, enough of that. I've, I've sinned. He can't forgive you of what you won't admit. Secondly, you must believe. Salvation is by grace through faith. You have to believe that Jesus died. You have to believe that he rose. And by believing, you receive life in his name. You must be willing to turn from your sin. This is what the Bible calls repentance. Last night, I was saying how since Helena is exactly halfway between Yellowstone National Park and Glacier National Park, Repentance would be, I'm heading to Yellowstone, but I turn around, and I'm heading to Glacier now. It's a 180. It's going from goofy to regular inside your soul, OK? So it's saying, I was looking for these things to satisfy. I'm turning to Jesus. I'm turning my life over. I'm deciding to follow Jesus. Jesus said, if you don't repent, you, must, you, will, you will perish. You have to turn your life over to him. As well, you must be willing to follow Jesus publicly, which is why in just a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to do what many thousands have done at school church events around the state of Montana. And that is get out of your seats and walk down these aisles, standing at the front of this stage facing me. And when you get here, I'm going to pray with you as you give your heart to Jesus Christ. And you might say, why on earth? Why the heck would I do that publicly? That's not going to happen right now. I'll just tell you that. Here's why. Jesus hung naked on a cross and died publicly for you with a bunch of people making fun of him. He wasn't ashamed to die for you. He calls you to live for him. 
Plus, he said, if you confess me before people, I will confess you before my Father and the angels in heaven. But he added, if you deny me before people, I will deny you before my Father and the angels in heaven. And I'll tell you, getting out of your seat like this, having a change, almost picturing your seat as your old life and, and, and crossing that line, taking a stand for Jesus as an act of the will, it will settle and seal this decision in your heart. There will be a before and after for you to remember. And finally, lastly, I would say this. This is a decision that you must not put off. You need to do it now. You need to get this settled. The biggest mistake you can make would be to say, I'll do it later. I'll do it on my deathbed. Whenever they tell me you have six months to live, then I'll be like, OK, now I need to get religious. Well, let me tell you, first of all, this isn't a religious thing. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. There is a difference. Religion can't save anyone, but Jesus can save everyone. But additionally, you know, to, to put this off, quite frankly, is to play Russian roulette with eternity. Because there's no guarantee you'll ever have another opportunity. Now you're like, oh, yeah, that's a preacher's trick. Lay on the heavy, you know, emotional, death's coming, get the soft keyboard playing. Now we'll all be tricked into making some decision, we, and tomorrow we won't want to. No, no, listen, I don't want to talk you into anything. Because if I can talk you into it tomorrow, you could be talked out of it. This has to be your decision, all right? And uh, when I say you're going to die and you might not have another opportunity, that's not like something I read in a book one time. This is my life. I know too painfully well that death can just show up without calling ahead. And you're just left dealing with it. And the day you die, there might not be any more notice other than why is that car in my lane over? What's that pain in my lights out. What if this was your last opportunity? You know the Bible says you can, but the Bible never says you can be saved tomorrow. Never gives that promise. The Bible will never tell you, you could be saved tomorrow, but it does say you could be saved today. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. You might not ever have another opportunity like this, but Jesus Christ right now is standing at the door of your heart. He's knocking, and if you invite him in, he will come in. So I call you to act on it right now. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this message. I've preached as well as I can. I know it's your spirit that drives these things home anyway. And so I pray now what you have told us is the gospel truth. Christ dead, risen, coming again. And our responsibility to choose, it's been set before us now. And I pray you'd give many the strength and the faith to respond to your Holy Spirit as you save them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said there are two roads, a road to heaven and a road to hell. And you're on one of these two roads right now. That's the bad news. Many of, of us are on the wrong road by default. But the good news is you can make a change. And right now, if you would like to give your life to Jesus Christ and get off the road you're on and get on the road headed to heaven, I want you to stand up right now, right where you're seated. Right in there, see, just come to the front of the stage. Just get out of your seat, just right now. Don't wait and look around. What is someone else going to do? They have their own soul, and so do you. You get out of your seat and come. Leave the bleachers. If you're in the middle of the aisle, just move. They'll, move, they'll make room for you. Get out of your seat and come stand up here. And when you get here, we're going to pray a simple prayer for you to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Get up now and come. Even now, just continue to join these who are up here. Scoot all the way forward. Make room for more. Get up out of your seat. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And as we sing, I want you just to come. Respond to Jesus Christ. Leave your old life behind. Turn from your sin. Turn from hell. Turn from death. Turn to Jesus who can save you. Come now. Let go. Come on.
believe there's perhaps more of you who need to make this decision and you're wrestling, maybe on the inside, you're fighting and you just, you, you know you need to do this and, and yet you're afraid. What I wanna tell you is you take that first step of faith and God will give you the courage to take the next one. This invitation isn't just for those, you know, who are hearing this and it's like a light bulb being turned on. You're realizing the error of your ways. This also is an invitation that goes out to some who know this coal, all this material, all this content, all this truth about Jesus. You were saying amen, amen, amen all the way. And, and you know this truth. But here's the danger. You can know truth that you haven't believed. You can miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance from your head to your heart. One of my least favorite verses in the Bible is when Jesus said that there are going to be many people, many religious people on Judgment Day who are going to go kicking and screaming all the way to hell, telling God how many good things they did, how much church they went to, all the stuff they did for Jesus. And he's going to say, but listen, I never knew you. It's not about what you know about God or what you know about the Bible, or I'm an American. I drive a Ford and I'm a Christian. That's just how we are in this nation. No, 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 no. Listen, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to Panda Express makes you a panda bear, OK? Congratulations on the new Panda Express. I saw that in the newspaper today. It's my three-year-old Daisy's favorite place to eat in the whole world. So we can come back to Helen now, now officially. But okay, I'm getting distracted. This invitation goes out to those who have gone to church their whole lives but need to give their lives to Jesus Christ. And maybe there's many like that. Whatever the case, as we continue to sing this song, I want you to get out of your seat if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. If you're very religious or not religious at all, it's about a relationship. I want you to get out of your seat if you sense God calling you to give your life to him, to make this commitment or a, or a, or a fresh commitment to him. Come now. Let go. Come to Christ. So let go sing that through one more time. And I promise that's it. We're not going to drag this thing out all evening. But I just want to say that we're going to sing this through one more time, give you one last chance. And then this invitation will come to a close. And we'll pray with those, those many of you who have, who have come and those of you online who are watching who are ready to give your heart to Jesus too. But before we sing it one, one last time through, I just want to speak to maybe someone who's concerned with the, what those around you might think. Like, you want to do this, but you're like, uh, my friends would think it's lame, my, my parents, whatever. My, 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 maybe you're thinking my kids would think whatever. You know, it's not for young people. It's old people. All, all people need to come to Jesus. Why would you say I might be thinking about, you're like, why would you say that? I, I don't think anyone is right. I, I only say that because the day I gave my heart to Christ, as God was nudging me to, to do what I, maybe God's calling you to do, all I could think about was the people around me. And it's a silly thing, really, because when I, when I die, I'm not going to stand before my friends. When I die, I'm not going to stand before my family, and neither are you. You're going to stand before Jesus. And if your parents are saved, if your dad's saved, if your wife is saved, or husband is saved, that doesn't help you out at all. The tickets to heaven, they admit one. This is your soul. This is your eternal destination. This is between you and Jesus. What are you going to do? You need to stand on your own two feet and give your life to Jesus Christ. We're going to sing this through one more time. You come. Join these who are already up here. Let go. Come on, right now, and then we'll pray.
Come on, let's all put our hands together for these who have made this amazing decision. I just want to tell you all, every one of you who have responded, this isn't what saves you. It's not like, oh, you got out of your seat. It's Jesus on the cross, his resurrection. That's the only way we can be saved. This is how you, by faith, say, I receive it, putting your faith in him. But we are all the same, still proud of you, because that took guts to do what you just did. It takes guts to stand up and say, I love God. I'll trust God in a world that doesn't. I'm, I'm honored to have been here on this evening, October 27, 2013, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'll, be, I'll be grateful that I got to be here for all my life. I want to lead you in a prayer as you give your heart to Jesus. This goes to those of you on the internet or radio who you're saying, I, I want to pray too, but I'm like on my laptop in, in, in Iceland. What do I do? Pray with us, OK? Is that, is that good if they join in? You guys OK with that? If anyone on the internet wants to get saved too? OK, cool. Making sure. Don't want to cross any boundaries. I, I'm new to Helena. OK, I want to just lead you in a simple prayer that you're going to ask Jesus to come into your heart. This is between you and him, OK? Pray this out loud after me. Say, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I've done wrong things. I can't fix myself. But I believe that Jesus died in my place. I believe that he rose from the dead. And I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me. Change me. Make me a new person. I turn from my sin. I turn to you in faith. Be my Savior, my Lord, and help me to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Listen, the Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's a simple, you're like, that's it, that's it, that's it. You believe and you receive. It's a gift that you've just accepted. And if that has happened, if you just put your faith in Jesus, then you're a brand new person. You might not feel different. You're going to look in the mirror. Do I shine? Do I glow? Listen, you're a brand new person, a new creation in Jesus Christ. All old things have been washed away. Behold, all things have become new. You've been born again inside your heart. And we have a gift that we want to give you. Look at this. Check this out. This is really cool. We have brought, every, well, for every one of you, one of these. It's called a Start Bible. And it has God's word in it and some notes on what does it mean to follow Jesus in a new relationship. We have one for each of you and a CD of a message I've given called What Just Happened, OK? Because that might be how you feel. Oh, what just happened? You're looking like, what am I doing? Uh, we have a, a message that I've just preached simple stuff from the Bible about what happens when you give your heart to Jesus. We love to give each of you one of these. You're not going to miss anything. But right to my right, this, this is Sam. His hand is raised. Could you all follow him? And you guys could all even just right now go this way. We're just going to give you one of these as a free gift. Just follow Sam right that way. It's going to take a long time because there is a ton of people in this place that just gave us to Jesus. Oh, he's got a light stick now. That's helpful. Just follow him right that way. There's so many. And for a whole year, we've been praying for this event. So let's give God some praise for what he has done here in the lives of so many people. Amazing. And we've got an epic after party coming. You aren't going to miss anything. We're going to wait so everyone gets back in here for the party. No one's going to want to leave early. It's going to get crazy. It'll be awesome in just a sec. But I want to speak to those of you on the internet for a moment. Uh, there, no doubt, are some of you who just gave your heart to Christ. You were watching on an iPhone, and you just prayed that prayer. You just, you just said the same thing these did here, and you just asked Jesus to come into your heart. And I want you to know that God has heard you. And if, if you have asked him to, he has come into your life and forgiven your sins too. And so we celebrate with you on the internet, don't we? We're stoked on that. And we would like to send you a Start Bible and the, the CD I told these guys about in the mail, free of charge, wherever you live. And so if you would click the link that says God at schoolchurch.com, it would be our great honor to mail you out one of these. We're not going to sign you up for some creepy mailing list that you're going to have to hit unsubscribe to 87 times and they'll never listen anyway. If you click that, we're going to send this to you free of charge in the mail. And it would be our, our, our joy to, to do that. 
As well, we've put together a page called the Share Your Story page. We're going to tell these guys out here about it. And it's just a way for you to let us know. I mean, we do these events. We go out in faith. And, and nothing blesses us more than when we get to hear the stories of life change. You know, people who are saying, hey, man, I was thinking about ending it all. Then I got this link on Twitter, clicked it, and all of a sudden, God just straight changed my life. If you would take a minute and in addition to registering your decision, share your story. You could be brief and type it out, or you could post a video to your YouTube account and give us the link. Either way, it would be just a massive blessing to our team to get to read that and celebrate with you. It's like rocket fuel for us as we continue to do this. Now, I want to say that we have been very grateful in the city of Helena to partner with so many great churches throughout this area that have helped us promote and make this event possible. And I'd just like to say thank you to every epic Bible teaching church that's come on board and been a part of this. Encourage you, if you're not in one, get planted in God's house. The Christian walk is something we're not meant to do alone. And uh, we, are, we are so excited uh, as we continue to go forward with Gold Church events. And we hope at some point to come back to Helena. If you guys would like that and have us, we'd like to come back at some point. I'll take that meager response as indication that some of you would like that. And uh, the rest of you, let me just say this. It's going to be an epic evening we still have in store. Let's be praying for these who have made this decision and encouraging them in the days to come. I'm going to turn things over to our host who's going to lead a song. Make some noise. Come on, guys. Bless you. <laughs>